Helen Frankenthaler's oil paintings are a rare experience. Not just for their visual qualities, though the works are beautiful. These paintings are outstanding for how they both embrace and subvert the notion of liveness in painting. In the early 1950s, Frankenthaler began to develop her signature soak stain technique with works such as Mountains and Sea, where turpentine thinned oils were painted onto unprimed canvas. This resulted in the watery, soft, and flat appearance that defines her body of work. It also resulted in the works being non-archival. The unprimed canvases which Frankenthaler worked on are being slowly rotted by the oil and the paint she applied to them, and in some cases, the damage is already obvious and visible. Only about 50 years in, many of her pieces pose a challenge to conservators. Oil paintings made on properly prepared surfaces can be effectively preserved for hundreds of years, and in regulated museum settings, many paintings are still in good condition after half a millennium. By contrast, I myself am likely to outlast some of the Frankenthalers I have seen. In her later work, Frankenthaler began to instead use the newly available acrylic paints, which could be applied to an unprimed surface without issue. I would never fault Frankenthaler for making this transition, but the oil paintings are a different experience, and something I find quite special in the canon of painting. The effect for me has been an urgency, though not of an anxious sort. Rather, I feel compelled to be fully present with the painting. It is a gladness that I am at just the right time and place to know the painting. The paintings are present and alive right now because I know they will not always be. Bluntly, they feel alive. An essential part of the framework for Frankenthaler's work is the myth of the living painting. Isabel Gras writes regarding this myth in The Love of Painting. Gras posits that this myth emerges from perceptions of aliveness in painterly expression, a phenomenon she terms vitalistic fantasies. It is important to understand the appeal of this myth and why painting is especially conducive to vitalistic fantasies. Firstly, the living painting myth is attractive because it distinguishes and elevates painting above both mere craft and other forms of art. Establishing art as a distinct category typically supposes a sort of alchemy where, by creative labor, an artist can transform inert materials into something more than themselves. Extrapolating from that premise, the living painting myth posits that a painter can imbue their work with the essence of life. Further, this myth is often invoked to suggest that one can transcend by means of painting, that a painter can live on through their work in the same way that one might through blood lineage. Perhaps more than anything else, it is this promise of immortality, or at least immortalization, that has contributed to the continued appeal and prevalence of this myth in the history of painting. As the name suggests, this myth is almost exclusively associated with painting, and the reason for this is, in large part, singularity. Singular, as an art term, refers to objects which are not replicable, or of which only one exists. Paintings are singular works because each is made entirely by hand through a process which cannot be recreated exactly. Prints, photographs, and casted sculptures are made by mechanical and infinitely repeatable processes, meaning they are not singular. When an artwork is singular, there is a privilege inherent to it. Being with a painting is the sense that you are among just a few persons, or perhaps the only one at the moment to have that experience. I want to be clear, 
that for an artwork to be singular is not an unqualified good. When only one copy of a piece exists, a huge number of people are necessarily unable to experience it. The inaccessibility of visual art is exacerbated by undue reverence for singularity in art. Still, there is an undeniable quality to singular works in the manner in which they relate to the audience. Singularity is not simply better, but it is particular. Moreover, it is this particularity that informs the living painting myth, and it is why other art forms are less often perceived as possessing life. Life is a condition only ascribed to distinct beings, not impressions or casts produced ad nauseum. To be alive, a subject must be forged entirely new, hence the propriety of painting, where each piece is definite and unique. The end product of painting cannot be mechanically reproduced, rather it is the inspired arrangement of a highly reactive material. This is why the living painting remains a powerful, evocative, and popular idea. While I do not want to appear uncritical of this myth, it must be recognized that the basis for it is not entirely unreason. As for the history of this myth, vitalistic fantasies were cultivated in pre-modern painting largely by perceptions that the figures in a painting felt alive and later on by more indirect methods. We see the beginnings of this change in early modernist painting, where vitalistic fantasies often arrive as a result of embedded signifiers of the painting process, looser and more expressive brushwork, pentimenti, and the uneven levels of finish. In this model, liveness is more an effect of our sense that the painting is a made thing and the perceived humanity of its author rather than the veracity of the painted subjects. As this alternate conception of liveness in painting is disseminated, and as we approach the contemporary dialogue, painting as a practice becomes more various and indefinite, and so do the methods by which liveness is achieved in it. While tracking these myriad developments is worthwhile, for my purpose, I just want to focus on a distinctly modernist conception of liveness, along with the related idea of singularity as they pertain to Frankenthaler. Throughout the course of modernism, the understanding of the painterly process as an activity of imbuing or creating life was gradually developed into the notion of the painting itself as an independent, autonomous entity. This idea that the object of a painting was itself alive, with no regard to the visual subjects, became prevalent among artists working in the mid-20th century who, not coincidentally, explored greater and greater degrees of abstraction, such as the abstract expressionists in New York, among which was Frankenthaler. In this quote from an interview with Julia Brown, Frankenthaler explains her process, reacting to a painting as if it were an autonomous being. Quote, There has to be that dialogue in which you both surprise yourself and allow for the process of carrying out what you have envisioned. When Matisse made a portrait, he might have first put his subject on a stool, or in front of a mirror, or behind a piano. He might have had an idea to begin with, but the painting took him elsewhere. He might have put in something that disturbs the entire chin line and makes the chin part of the wall, because that's what the painting required. The person as figure remains, but changes. Painting is a constant process of renewal and discovery. It's invigorating. And it's a gift that is spontaneous, immediate, felt, absorbing." Unquote. So, the conceptualization of painting as a form of alchemy and the modernist iteration of the living painting myth are present in Frankenthaler's work. However, her paintings do not operate precisely as expected in this framework. The non-archival nature of the oil paintings is at odds with the idea that painting is a transcendent craft. 
abstract expressionism sought embodiment and distillation of human emotion and experience, and Frankenthaler embraced this in an absolute manner. Of course, her work is emotional and volatile in the sense of most abstract expressionist painting, where the visual language is one of loose gestures guided by haptic appeal more than a removed aesthetic consideration. However, beyond genre trappings, the transience of Frankenthaler's oil paintings as actively and visibly aging objects makes them uniquely relatable. These works exist on a similar timeline to us, and there is a wonderful human dignity and sympathy to her painting's refusal of the uneasy immortality typically sought in relation to the living painting myth. Frankenthaler's oil paintings contain life on the condition that they also contain death. The work of art is so frightened of the world at large, it so needs isolation in order to exist, that any conceivable means of protection will suffice. It frames itself, withdraws under glass, barricades itself behind a bulletproof surface, surrounds itself with protective cordon, with instruments showing the room humidity for even the slightest cold would be fatal. Ideally, the work of art finds itself not just screened from the world, but shut up in a safe, permanently and totally sheltered from the eye. And yet, isn't such extremism bordering on the absurd already with us, every day, everywhere, when the artwork exhibits itself in those safes called galleries, museums? Isn't it the very point of departure, the end? and the essential function of the work of art that it should be exhibited? The Lascaux Caves in the southwest of France have scribed on their walls hundreds of paintings dating to the Upper Paleolithic era. Following their discovery in the early 1940s, the caves were opened to the public in 1948 by 1963, the ravages of tourism had caused significant damage to the cave paintings, and Lascaux was closed to the public as it remains today. Since then, a number of replicas have been made of the caves and paintings therein, but the originals are granted only occasional visitation by a select few preservationists. The Lascaux Caves are a massively significant site in understanding the nature of art and humans at large. Further, I do not doubt the prudence of protecting the site. Still, it is not immediately obvious what the caves are being preserved for. Curiously, the committee responsible for Lascaux's preservation has asserted the site is a, quote, legacy belonging to all mankind, unquote but almost no humans are permitted to view it under any circumstances. Granted, the nearly uninhibited tourism from before led to rapid degradation, but in its current state, at least for the mankind to which Lascaux apparently belongs, the paintings might as well be gone entirely. People have a difficult time with death. Often, we determine that creation is a means of evading death, and a great collective effort is made to preserve works only a few hundred years old or less. So Lascaux, already 17,000 years along, is itself the idea that humans can leave something behind. The cave paintings are proof positive of the indomitable spirit of the transcendent power of human creativity to defy the natural order. To see it falling apart is not just the loss of something beautiful, but an event inciting existential dread. For this reason, there is strength in knowing that Lascaux exists even if you cannot see it. The virtue of that strength is another issue. Art objects appear as undeniable proof of the human, and the retention of this proof is understandably tempting. 
Still, I want to suggest that there is a greater strength in embracing the fleeting. Loss can be a tragedy, but tragedy is not antithetical to art. While the notion of transcendence by creation can embolden one to create more persistently and to find happiness in that, I believe it is ultimately beneficial to be cleared of such myths and find truer reasons to make. Frankenthaler exemplifies how the desire for objects can be tempered with an acceptance of mortality, all without any compromise to the outcome of her creation. A piece is not made more beautiful by unnatural perpetuation, and we should accept for death in art just as we should for ourselves.